so tonight's show, for those of you who haven't read your program already, is inspired. Um, John, I think I could safely say, and he'll tell you more, inspired by the great Django Reinhardt, the French gypsy jazz guitarist. That's a starting point for John, not an ending point. But let's talk a little bit about the great Django. So um, from a little bit of uh, research, I understand that from 1925 to 1933, these were very formative years for Django, both personally and musically. And specifically, he abandoned the banjo, which he had been playing previously, and then went to the guitar. So what happened? Well, I, I think what happened, you know, Django grew up in a musical family. His, uh, a, a traveling, uh, his parents were part of a traveling troupe of entertainers. His father was a violinist and band leader, and his mother was a dancer, and they were gypsies. So literally, they would have their wagon with a piano on it and some other instruments, and they would go around a circuit where they'd stop in a town and do their show. And, and so Django was actually born, um, his, his mother was leaving their campsite to go to the perform at the show, and she went into labor. So she didn't perform that night. Detail, she, details. Yeah, she, uh, she had, had Django. And, and so, you know, he was around musicians his whole life, learning how to play. He could also play violin, but he was really attracted to the, the banjo at first. And he tuned the banjo like a guitar and was prodigious. And by the time he was 14, his family lived outside of Paris. There were some areas where there was a lot of gypsy caravans. And so he started making money, earning money to support his family by playing with the most famous accordion players, playing a style of music called musette. And when we think of musette now, we might think it's kind of light and, and airy music, but it was the it was kind of the rough, it was like a honky-tonk in, in Paris. Mm -hmm. You know, that's where kind of rough people would go to dance. And in fact, the the band stand was uh, like sort of a Juliet balcony, you know, built into the side of the wall of the venue. And, and they would climb up a ladder to get in, and then they'd pull up the ladder behind them so <laughs> no one could come after them, because it was pretty rough. But of course, you know, accordion can be kind of loud, and the banjo guitar can be kind of loud. So it would be heard, you know, projected before my microphones and things. And then uh, in, when he was 18 years old, uh, he came home from working. And uh, by that time, he had married. And his wife was making celluloid flowers to sell to, for people to put on grave sites. Well, so th their little caravan was full of those. And, and Django was changing clothes, and he had a candle to see by, and he moved quickly. And wax fell off the candle onto that celluloid, and the place just burst into flames. And he was able to get his wife out, and he was able to get himself out. Um, he wrapped a blanket around himself, but he held the blanket with his left hand, and his left leg was exposed. So those got severely burned. And his relatives took him to a hospital, which gypsies at that time didn't like anything like a building that couldn't move. You know, their houses were movable, and that's so they were superstitious of a, a building, you know, like so just to go in the hospital was kind of a, a stretch. And then the, they said they wanted to amputate his leg, and they're like, no, we're not doing that. So they took him somewhere else, and they started, uh, you know, putting ointments on and stuff and, and trying to help him recover. And, you know, his hand was burned really badly so that these two fingers, ring finger and little finger, were pulled back like that, and the tendons were, were scarred and burned in such a way that he couldn't open them or straighten them out. So they were just stuck in that position. So everyone thought, oh, he's never going to play again. You know, this was our... He, he was really a star already within his community because his... His talent was so obvious and charisma. And uh, so one day, uh, one of his friends thought, you know, maybe if I bring a guitar, you know, it might help his hand to, to heal a little bit more if he's moving his fingers or whatever like that. Well, he started to mess around with the guitar and figured out how to play basically just using these two fingers. And, and that was before he became the most famous guitarist in the world. So that was in, in the, well, he was born in 1910. So that would have been uh, 1928. Uh, and, and then in, in the 30s, he, he was accompanying Jean Sablon. Jean Sablon was like the uh, Bing Crosby of, of France, you know, a popular crooner. And then 
some people, uh, kind of people that had a jazz society there in, in France, and they would get together to listen to jazz records because that was a difficult thing to hear jazz, you know. And Django heard uh, Louis Armstrong and just fell in love with that sound of, of New Orleans jazz and also the jazz of Duke Ellington and uh, the, the stuff that was coming out of America in those days. So he started to try to play that on the guitar and and these people said, we should form a little group around this guy. So he met Stefan Grappelli, who was a fantastic violinist who also played jazz, which was unusual. And then they had another friend playing a rhythm guitar, another friend playing the bass like this. And uh, they did a little show and, and Stefan could tell that Django was not happy. He said, what's wrong? He said, well, when you're playing a solo, you have me and our rhythm guitarist behind you. You have two guitarists behind you. When I'm playing a solo, I only have one guitar. And so Stefan said, oh, fine, let's get your brother. So you'll have two behind you. And that became the, the quintet of the Hot Club of France. And because jazz in those days was sort of raucous, you know, mostly like trumpet, trombone, saxophone, drums, things like that, um, this was a jazz group that was all string instruments. So it was much more quiet, elegant, delicate, and they became kind of the hit of the Paris, uh, what would you say, the, the, the Paris elite, really. They, they loved this and music. This is, this is the late 20s, early 30s. This would 30s. be, they first recorded in 1934. So this would be 35, 36, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that kind of time period. And they became very popular uh, among the Society of France. Mm -hmm. And they recorded, people heard their records. There were some impresarios from England that came to see them, brought them over to England to tour a number of times. And uh, they were even more popular in England probably than in France because they toured there quite a bit. And then uh, in, when, when Paris got occupied, when the war broke out, they were supposed to start a tour in England. Well, Django decided to go home. Stefan Grappelli stayed there. Mm -hmm. So during the war, they were, they were not together. Mm -hmm. And Django being in Paris at that time and a jazz musician, um, you couldn't get American jazz records in, in France at that time. So any French artists that played jazz were very, very popular. So that was his, as far as popularity, that was his most popular time was during the occupation. And even the, you know, even the German soldiers and guards were fans of his. You know, he tried to leave at one point, got over the Swiss border, and then he got lost and tried to come back. Well, the border guard was a, a fan and let him back in. So, you know, he wasn't a sympathizer. He was just trying to make do during this time period. And then, strangely, he was reunited with Stefan Grappelli after the war. But his music, especially in France, reminded everyone of the occupation. So they didn't want to hear that sound anymore. So he became a uh, passe in a way or just you know we don't want to hear that and he, he that disappointed him a lot so he started painting more than even playing the guitar but in 1946 Duke Ellington invited him to America his only time to America and he was a guest soloist on Duke's tour at that time and then in 1953 he had started playing again he was uh, kind of uh, influenced by the bebop and started playing with some younger jazz musicians and, and expanding his style with the electric guitar and um, Norman Grants, who did the uh, jazz at, at the Philharmonic, he was looking for Django to be part of that. Mm -hmm. Les Paul, by that time, had become a huge pop artist, Les mm -hmm. Paul and Mary Ford, and Django was his favorite guitarist, mm -hmm. so he was gonna ask Django to open for him on a tour of America, and Bing Crosby, who uh, Eddie Lang had been his guitar accompanist, and Eddie Lang had passed away, and, and he was looking for Django as well. So all of that was happening right before he died. Mm. So Which it, was? 1953. Mm. And uh, it, he had a stroke, and, uh, you know, had, had that not happened, there, you know, it would, would have gone further. A lot of more people would know about him, yeah. I'd like to... Back up a minute. You said something which I had actually never heard before, and I'd, I'd like to know a little bit more about this. You said that in France, 
at that time, it was almost impossible to get jazz records. Yeah. Well, I'm just floored by that. How did that, so how were they? Well, they were occupied by, the Germans occupied Paris at that time. But I even, so, I, even underground, were, were recordings not making it into people's? Well, you could, you know, probably like they would make those, uh, uh, what was the U.S. Armed Forces radio, mm -hmm. you know, things that would be broadcast. Well, maybe someone could get that and make a tape of it or something mm -hmm. like that. But it wasn't like the average French person could go down to the record store right. and buy a Benny Goodman record. But Paris in the 20s had a real jazz scene. It was huge. Yeah, that's, yeah. It was fan. And, and where and were they? So where were they? Get it? How did they get it? How were they hearing it? Where? Did, how did it make its way from well, America that, to? Then, then they could get get that stuff. Oh, I see. It's just when it's the just when the war was going oh, on. I yeah, see. that. Okay. Yeah, everything shut down. Okay. So, that, like I said, it was there was a number of, of French artists that were very popular mm -hmm. at that time. Is the term hot jazz? Where exactly does that come from? I actually think it kind of comes from New Orleans, but I'm not sure. You know, not Paris. No, no. See, the, the the it's funny because they this was a group of guys. The Hot Club of France right. was a, a group of French people that were jazz, American jazz fans, mm -hmm. and so even at that time, it wasn't um, it wasn't banned to get these records, but it also wasn't. Wasn't super easy. easy. Right. So they would gather together and, and have little parties where they would listen to the latest records or whatever they'd gotten from America. Mm -hmm. So that, they called their organization the Hot Club because uh, there was a, 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 there was the song Hot Lips. Mm -hmm. that was, uh, was it Henry Bussey, I think? Um, and, and, and that would be a term that, that they would call New Orleans jazz hot jazz. Mm -hmm. So it really, so much of this music, which is considered European, actually came from America. Right. It's just Europeans were hearing it and translating it with their own style. And so then they, you know, they formed this quintet of the Hot Club of France. Their records got sent back to America. And you know, people, uh, swing musicians here, Western Swing, for example, uh, Tiny Moore and Johnny Gimble, mm -hmm. uh, would, would hear this music. And Jethro Burns, with the comedy team of Homer and Jethro, those guys, when they weren't playing their comedy songs, would play songs from Django and wow. Stefan. Wow. So their influence came back to America, you know, and then eventually people like David Grisman, who's a, a mandolinist, mm -hmm. right. he was really inspired by this hot jazz from France, and he was an American bluegrass mandolin player. So he kind of combined American bluegrass and this French version of, of hot jazz, and he mm -hmm. created his own style of music, which, you know, now has kind of maybe people could say that might have started some of the jam band music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this, this influences just go from one thing to the other and they fan out. So now there's this music that has the moniker of gypsy jazz and it's been, it's been around for a while from, from my seat, just being aware of watching music and listening in the last, let's say 10 years, it's had a bit of a resurgence here in America. Yeah. Is that, okay, yes, you're great? Yes. Okay. Yes. And is that happening elsewhere around the world or is it something where it's particularly having a renaissance or a, or a, or a moment, if you will, here in America? Probably America, a little bit more. America and maybe other countries like Australia and Canada. Um, in Europe, this music has existed you know, basically since right. Django and Stefan created it. And it never went away. It never went away. It might have been more or less popular, but uh, it, it was more like um, if you've ever been to a bluegrass festival mm -hmm. and the way bluegrass music is, it's not popular like on the radio or anything, but it's right. always there. Mm -hmm. And people learn it, they teach it to each other, mm -hmm. they go and jam around a campfire, mm -hmm. there's festivals. Right. Well, in Europe, that gypsy jazz is like that. What is the name of, there's a, uh, Cyril, I may mention this, there's a town on the outskirts of Paris where they do the gypsy gathering festival and well, they all come in place. Yeah, well, sur -mer, is the Saint-Marie uh, sur le Mer is one. That's a big gypsy gathering of all gypsies from all over Europe. That must be fun. Oh, it, it, it's amazing. <laughs> you imagine. And then there's also a, uh, the, 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 the last, uh, the place where Django spent the last few years of his life is called Samois-sur-Seine. And it's a, a small village south of Paris 
on the Seine River, mm -hmm. and they have a festival. They started like maybe the fifth anniversary of his death or something like that. They mm -hmm. they started having a festival there of, mm -hmm. of this style of music, mm -hmm. and it's grown to the point where now they have it every year. And uh, I'm really, this is one of my most proud moments as a, an American musician who loves this style of music. Mm -hmm. um, I'm the only American gypsy jazz guitarist that has ever headlined that festival. Wow, that's big. So, uh, uh, well, thank you. Uh, that's huge. You know, the French are very particular, so. Oh, and, and there was, a, a, you know, a lot of people in the audience were like this. <laughs> and uh, I was very me. nervous, but, uh, you know, by, by a, you know, within a couple of songs, they could realize that how much I love this music and you know, what, sure. what I wanted to bring to it. So. Well, speaking of which, you were mentioning before this thing about the two fingers. Can you pick up your guitar for a second and sure. just helps, help us all here understand because it's, a, it's quite an extraordinary technique sure. if you've never seen this before. Um, so, you know, American guitar players, you see a lot of this kind of chord. This is called a bar chord where you use your first finger all the way across and then these other fingers you're going to create other notes with. Um, so... In order to do that chord, Django wouldn't, he wouldn't use that chord. So he, he found all these other chords, which were more col colorful chords, really. Uh, six, nine chords. And then for single note things, he would also use his, he could, he could put, the, these two fingers were stuck like this, but he could put it on there and play a three note chord like that. And then he would, Mm -hmm. Or do chords like this. So Is that just two notes you're doing? No. Four. Four notes, but only with these two fingers. Wow. Or. So, hmm. again, that's just a D minor arpeggio, mm -hmm. but when you add that one in there, it gives mm -hmm. the minor sixth. Right. And those kind of things gave Gypsy Jazz its flavor mm -hmm. and its color. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't sound like blues, it doesn't sound like American jazz, mm -hmm. and then for single note things, you would think, oh, well, how's uh, most an American guitarist would play a scale like this? With with all your fingers across the strings, but Django would play up up and down like that. And all kinds of different techniques, like uh, uh, and double, like double down, where you mm. and you can do that across a couple strings, and you would get this kind of a action. So mm. all of these tricky things that he could figure out with just the two fingers. You know, play a scale instead of a, uh, uh, let's see. He would, he would mm. shift and do position shifts. Now has this technique that you've obviously learned, has this seeped into the way that you play in all the different styles of music that you're playing now? Because I know you have a, a very, very diverse and wide repertoire. Has it affected really how you play in general? Some, yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing about this guitar and this style of music, this guitar is unusual. People will say, why does it have a small sound hole? Um, it doesn't look like a regular guitar. It's because it's not. It's a completely different design. Um, it has some things in common with some other guitars, but it it's not completely flat. It's got a slight dome is here. Is this a custom guitar? No. The, well, this is the well. It is a signature model guitar okay. that, that it's uh, of mine, but it's patterned after the guitars that Django played. They were built by the Selmer Company in uh -huh. France, right. who was very known for saxophones and clarinets, and mm -hmm. um, but they, so it's a French. Uh, it's an Italian designer that the French hired. Mario McAfee was the designer. Mm -hmm. Selmer was the builder. Mm -hmm. And so it has a domed front right here. Uh, it has a, a tailpiece and bridge that are movable mm -hmm. like a carved arch top, but mm -hmm. it's not carved. It's pressed. Mm -hmm. 
the a folk guitar, a Martin guitar, will have an X brace, which means under the under the soundboard you have things that support the top in an X pattern. The, the classical guitars have called ladder brace, and they they go across like a ladder. Well, this has ladder bracing on it, like a mm -hmm. classical. It's got a headstock like a classical, mm -hmm. but the sta the scale of the neck is longer than even a Fender guitar. It's very long scale, mm -hmm. so the strings are tight, but they're very light gauge strings, mm. so they're not so hard to play. So I everything about it is is unique, and even the pick is unique. It's very very thick. This is five millimeters thick. Mm -hmm. And usually people use tortoise shell or some sort of a false tortoise shell so that you can get a lot of sound out of, out of the guitar. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but to answer your question, uh, learning his style made me learn the whole fingerboard all the way up and down because he doesn't just stay in a box mm -hmm. like blues. Mm -hmm. He travels all the way up and down, which mm -hmm. makes the sound a lot more colorful because you're using you know, this, this note here. Sounds, it's the same pitch as that, but that's a different tonality, you know? Mm -hmm. So you're using a lot more color of the guitar. And those things definitely influence my playing on other instruments. Okay, let's talk about, um, let's spread a little bit out of the Django box if we could. You, uh, I was reading about your, the music that you play and I found this very, very interesting description that uh, you start with gypsy jazz and then add elements of Latin, Romanian, rock, classical, and Greek, and call it all 21st century world music. So I'd like to know, I'm just, that just, I read that and I was like, okay, I want, please explain. Okay, well, mm -hmm. it, it, I'll, there'll be examples and stuff during the, during the show because mm -hmm. um, actually, you know, be getting interested in Django Reinhardt that got me interested in the gypsy culture. Mm -hmm. And when I got interested in the gypsy culture, I realized that, okay, gypsy music in France sounds like Django, but if you go over to Spain, it sounds like the Gypsy Kings. It's flamenco, right? right? And if you go to Bulgaria, there's a whole tradition of brass music. Right. And, and it, it started because those people were masons. They worked with stone and stuff. Mm. So their fingers were too fat for playing string instruments, violin oh. and things. Mm. So they started playing brass instruments. Jeez. So there's this Bulgarian brass music that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And then you get the Romanian music, which is, has the cymbalum and, and violin. And, and that's sort of the classic gypsy music that you think of. If you think of gypsy music not associated with jazz or anything. Mm -hmm. So, and then you get to, you know, more Arabic countries and, and it sounds more Arabic. And so the gypsies who have stayed in each one of those places incorporate the elements into their own music. Mm -hmm. So I started hearing all these other styles of music and I, I was influenced by them and started writing with those elements in mind. Mm -hmm. So, and in doing that, I can't become someone different. So all of my other influences were already there mm -hmm. from growing up playing classical music, for example, or mm -hmm. playing rock or mm -hmm. anything else. Those are still part of me. Part of you, sure. So they all end up kind of coming out together. And mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a Greek instrument, for example, the bazooki. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I was inspired to, to learn how to play that. Uh, by a, a gypsy, Greek gypsy singer named Kostas Pavlidis. And I loved his music, and they used a lot of bazooka. Is that like an oud? Is that a uh, Well, or? it's the oud is more Middle Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, the oud, it's got the same shape of a body. Mm -hmm. It's a little bigger. Mm -hmm. The oud has a wider neck, and the oud's headstock and tuners go back at a mm -hmm. sharp angle like this. Mm -hmm. And the strings are... These are metal strings, steel strings, so you mm. hear the, they sound bright. Mm. The oud has uh, gut strings, mm -hmm. so it's a darker sound, right. mm -hmm. but they're obviously, they're related. Mm -hmm. You know, each, each country kind of adapts the instruments to their own right. style and culture. Well, so that's where the, some of the Greek elements will come in. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, so one of the things that that we've had a wonderful time with here at this series, which we have a little sub-moniker, Jazz Spoken Globally, because there are so many musicians from so many other cultures and countries, as you talk about, who 
have looked through this music through the prism of their own experience and what pops out is something quite unique. Um, so I thought it was fascinating that you described yourself as creating a 21st century world music. I thought that was really interesting and it shows, your, it shows the breadth of your exposure and knowledge and that was one of the reasons I thought it would be great to have you here is that you're just, you have uh, a wide, a wide well, perspective and that's well, not, al so not always the case. Interestingly enough in jazz, jazz is about the most argued about and disagreed upon music in the entire <laughs> Western Hemisphere. Well, try, and get t try and get five jazz musicians to agree on what jazz is and like, good luck. Well, you know, one thing that I, I think is pretty funny, and, and I didn't even realize this until a few years ago, and, you know, one of the, one of the early marketing elements of jazz was that it was improvised, right. and that these people just had this magic and they could just do it. Mm -hmm. Well, originally, that was just a marketing ploy mm -hmm. from the record companies. Mm -hmm. They were trying to explain this new music mm -hmm. because in the early days of recording, you had to play exactly what you were going to play. It had to be, there was only a certain amount of time that you could have mm -hmm. on the piece of wax or whatever that they were carving this record. And if you played too loud, it, it could cause the needle to jump <laughs> or too soft. So you would have to show the engineers in the studio exactly what you were going to do and make sure it didn't go out of any of these parameters, right? Mm -hmm. So this was, originally this was not improvised. Mm -hmm. It was very set, mm -hmm. you know? But that marketing aspect took off and people believed that. Mm -hmm. And it sort of became true after the fact, but originally mm -hmm. it was not true. Yeah. Well, a lot of people don't realize that in classical music, if you go back to Mozart and Bach, they were great improvisers. Um, those, those, they, what, when you listen to many pieces and they play them and then they go back and there's another, another version of the same chords but with all kinds of different fills and it's a, it's a fascinating thing to me how in classical music that art is somewhat, for players, is somewhat lost today. And most, exactly. young, most young classical musicians who can play the most magnificent uh, players of, of things that are written down are absolutely lost yeah, at the concept of improv improvising, they just they wouldn't know where to begin. Well, and the cadenza, which was a big right. part of every you know concerto right. or something, right. it's supposed to be right. improvised. Right. You know, you're supposed to make it up. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, a lot of people don't realize, and I I don't understand it, but you do. So, why don't you tell us a little bit how it's a lot of guitar famous guitar players will list Django as one of their influences, and I'll name three of them. And just give us a little insight into okay. some of the people like sure. Eric Clapton, uh -huh. Chet Atkins, and Keith Richards, all of whom say that Django was one of their primary influences. Well, uh, Chet Atkins, I, I, I could speak pretty pretty much of because uh, he not only he recorded a lot of Django's songs. One of them called Django's Castle. Uh, the original French title was Manoir de mes rêves, which means House of My Dreams. But he recorded it as Django's Castle. Mm -hmm. And he, he went on record to say that Django was the only musician that he ever went and asked for his autograph. Huh. So he drove up from East Tennessee, where he was living at the time, mm -hmm. to see Django with Duke Ellington in 1946 in Chicago. Wow. And waited by the stage door, got his program signed, and... I wish I had that program. I knew who does have it, but uh, but yeah. So then Chet Atkins, of course, went on to influence pretty much everyone in country, not only as a player but as a producer, mm -hmm. producing people like the Everly Brothers and mm -hmm. on and on. So you, you know that's one thread from Django that went on mm -hmm. through all of these things. Um, Charlie Christian was an early jazz guitarist. Mm -hmm. Was probably the first. American jazz guitar soloist. He was featured in Benny Goodman's Sextet. And he obviously loved Django because there's a recording of him playing St. Louis Blues. And the first three choruses, he plays Django's solos. Mm -hmm. And then he goes off into his own. Mm -hmm. And then he would go on to influence every jazz guitarist. Right. George Benson, for example, says Django is his favorite. Mm -hmm. And George Benson would influence mm -hmm. all these. So, and the rock guitarists of the 60s, especially, um, Peter Frampton is a good friend of mine. His father's favorite guitarist was Django. So he would play Django records for Peter when he was a young guy. And 
that crept into his playing. He doesn't play that style per se, but even when I heard him in Humble Pie, hard rock band uh, on their album Rocking the Fillmore, his solos had a slightly jazzy feel to them. Mm -hmm. So th there again, you know, he's a, then he went on to influence all kinds of rock guitarists. Mm -hmm. um, so it bluegrass the same way. Clarence White, um, people maybe know Tony Rice more, but Clarence was Tony's idol, and Tony loved Django. Mm -hmm. So he tried to put his, some of his lick into bluegrass guitar, and now you, uh, argue, arguably you would say Tony Rice is the most influential bluegrass guitarist. Mm -hmm. So it, it fans out in pretty yeah. much every direction. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have one more question for you, and then we'll take a question or two from our listeners here. This is one of my favorite questions to ask visiting uh, artists. Just imagine that you get some bad news. You're told, John, it's been great, but you are being sent to a desert island for the rest of your life. Sorry. However, the good news is there will be a CD player there, and you will have three CDs that you can take with you, and you will be able to, you will never die, you will live for eternity, and what are the three CDs that you could listen to forever? and never get, what are the three CDs you could not live without? Oh, this is difficult, but... That's the um, idea. Yeah. <sighs> well, yeah, I guess, you know, one of them would have to be some sort of a compilation, whichever I could find that had the most of Django's songs on it. <laughs> um, you know, there's been a bunch of different CD compilations of his music. Okay, so, so a so, Django compilation. Yeah, one would be that. Um, one would be uh, the, the St. Louis Symphony uh, with Leonard Slatkin as the conductor mm -hmm. doing uh, Ralph Vaughan Williams' Fantasia on a Theme by Thomas Tallis. Who knows that recording? Have you ever heard the piece? That's, you, why, you, that's why I always ask. I'm going to go right at that. Ralph Vaughan Williams is a, a British composer. Beautiful, beautiful music. And uh, Thomas Tallis was a, um, oh, what's a, uh, I forget the word for the kind of an ancient, more ancient style of music, not, not Gregorian chant, but um, something after that. But anyway, it was a melody from, an old, very old melody. Mm. And, and Ralph Vaughan Williams. And English. Yeah, okay. took that melody and uh, did a, a whole symphonic wow. thing with it. It's just, it's, uh, yeah, Tremendous. it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that would be, that would have to be there. And then, uh, oh, God, this is the, this really difficult. I think it, it might have to be the extended version of The Who live at Leeds. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because that every time I hear it, it makes me feel good. So, <laughs> uh, pardon? The Who. The Who, live the, at Leeds. Live at Leeds. Yeah. That's England, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we could go on and on here, but uh, we're, we're towards the end of our allotted time. So I would like to open it up if anyone has a question of... Oh, there we go. The question for those of you who couldn't hear it was that the perception is that John got started in classical music, classical guitar, and then evolved into other, all kinds of other things, Django and beyond, and how did that happen? Yeah. I'm not the same. The Beatles. Oh, okay. See, that's, that's also classical music to me, so, uh, yeah. Show, me, show music and the Beatles was my start. Okay. Um, well... My parents were both classical musicians. My mom was a piano teacher and taught piano in our house. My father was a conductor at the University of Redlands. So I was always around music from when I was really young. And I started first on the piano when I was five. Uh, I would sit and listen to my sister practice, who was two years older. And you know, not to be outdone, I would <laughs> learn her songs by ear and play them on the piano. That's the and key. my mom, being very smart at the time, she started me in a different book <laughs> so that I would also learn how to read music. 
And then uh, again, my sister, two years older, in fifth grade, it, those days you could pick a band instrument and learn that in fifth grade. So again, I was not going to be outdone. If she was going to play two instruments, then I was going to play two instruments. So I chose the clarinet, and I started that when I was eight. Mm. Do you still play clarinet? All right. All right. I like that. So uh, I, and then when, then when I was about 10, I, I really got interested in the guitar. Mm. And we had a ukulele around our house, so I started playing that. Um, it didn't sound so good for Day Tripper and things like that. So, uh, and my parents did originally didn't want to get me a guitar because they thought that it would be, it was a fad and it wasn't a serious music. And, and I was already practicing and taking lessons on piano and clarinet. So they felt, yeah, a kid's got to do something besides practice, you know. Mm. But I started borrowing guitars from other people and, you know, it's, I sort of shamed them into getting me a guitar. <laughs> And it took two years. And when I was 12, I got my first guitar. And I just loved it. And I, I just practiced all the time. And they told me that I could only practice the guitar after I'd practiced the piano and the clarinet. <laughs> but it was an electric guitar. So I could just unplug it and practice without any sound. <laughs> so, so eventually, the guitar kind of yeah. overtook the piano. Yeah. I can still play it a bit. But you know, I stopped when I was 13. At really playing it seriously. And then um, all through my schooling and through college, uh, I studied classical music. I eventually took a degree in bassoon, clarinet, and saxophone. Wow. And all the while playing rock and jazz and learning other things. And, and then th there's a huge Aspen connection for me in my whole musical development, actually. Uh, in 1978, the Aspen Music Festival was starting a jazz program. With and Ted Pilziker, or is it exactly with Ted? Exactly. Okay, Ted Pilziker, who was a vibes player, and yeah. there was a jazz program. I heard it many shows. Benedict Kent. And so they, uh, somebody from UCLA was also involved in putting it together, and they were bringing a drummer from UCLA that I used to be in a band with. They asked him, "Who do you want to be a bass player?" And he said, "Me." So I had a scholarship as a jazz bass player to the Aspen Music Festival, and I accepted it as long as I could also be in the classical program playing the bassoon. So I was here for that whole summer, and they, I got my tuition paid for and my board paid for, but uh, I mean my room paid for, but no food. So I had to just busk around on the streets to play whatever I could, you know, to make a little money for food. And I answered an ad at the music store that said, wanted jazz bass player for immediate gigs. I was like, okay, acoustic jazz bass player, right? So even in the jazz band there, I was playing a Fender bass. But I knew that I could probably check out a bass from the school. So I got a bass like that. I went to the rehearsal. And they weren't actually playing jazz, but it was a local mandolinist and guitarist that were quite good. And they were playing David Grisman's first album. And this was sort of a cross between jazz and bluegrass, and I'd never heard it before. It was new then. And there was a violinist also from the festival, and we had this little quartet. And so that was my introduction to bluegrass. And I eventually, you know, when I went back home after the summer, I, I learned mandolin, and eventually I ended up playing with Earl Scruggs and some of the finest bluegrass players in the world, and that started here in Aspen. Well, Aspen, Aspen is an amazing, amazing musical crossroads going back to 1946. It is, it is really incredible, all the people in this little, little town that have come through here in, you know, 60, 70, 80 years. It is nothing short of mind-boggling. And you go back to some of the early pictures from the music festival and see what was going on, and it's just stunning. Well, and and did you know, by the way, that at the old Red Onion, okay, on the walls of the Red Onion, there were pictures of Ray Brown, Billie Holiday, and Oscar Peterson, the giants of jazz who performed here in Aspen in the 1950s at the Red Onion. It's just oh, a wonderful little fantastic. piece of, of jazz uh, history that you just wouldn't know unless you just happened to know who they are. And one night I was there and I was like, oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. That's and you could <laughs> see there they were. And I asked the bartender, I said, what are these I said, oh, they played here. Well, the and then Freddie Fisher. And, just, and the something, by the way, if anyone ever heard of a f something called 
a jazz, the jazz party. The jazz party, which sounds like, well, what's that? Well, the jazz party was something that was started at the Hotel Jerome in 1960 by a man named Dick Gibson, who was an amateur, a man who was a businessman, who was a big fan of jazz. And a jazz party is basically, you invite a bunch of jazz musicians, and you put them into a room, and you don't, no one's in charge, <laughs> you just let them jam, and then people start to come and listen, and the jazz party became a format that was widely imitated to this day uh, in the United States, particularly now in retirement communities where people that are, have been around jazz for a long time just love old school jazz musicians and they love to hear them. And that started right here in Aspen, Colorado. It eventually became known, known as Gibson's Jazz Party. And then eventually Dick got older and the altitude bothered him and he moved it down to Denver. But then the jazz party started popping up in Scottsdale and oh, all, okay. these, all these communities and it started right here that's, in Aspen. That's what happens when a good idea is out there, yeah. right? Okay, we have time for one more question and you have to eat maybe. So anybody have a, if you'd like that, go ahead. Uh, I, 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 I know Link Ray, and I, I know about Link Ray. Um, I don't know Run, Chicken, Run, um, but his, his song Rumble is, is an iconic electric guitar sound, and there was all kinds of rumors and, and, and things going around that he poked holes in the speaker of his amp so to make it sound more raunchy, <laughs> and, you know, and, and that was also an, an early, early song that, I think George Harrison um, got to join the Beatles because he knew how to play raunchy. And, and John Lennon and Paul McCartney didn't know how to play it yet. <laughs> so that was, a, that was a big deal. I, I was going to say one other thing. About, I, I forgot about this totally, but in, in 1978, when I was a student here, uh, one of the big pieces that we performed was the Bach B minor mass. Mm -hmm. And the conductor of that particular piece was Leonard Slatkin. Oh who's the conductor of, of, of my Desert Island CD. So I got to play under him here nice. as well. Nice. John Jorgensen, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah.